guess I need to start this. Would, I, I could have honestly forgotten it and thought, oh, I better start it. Done that intentionally, maybe 10 minutes from now. But um, it is wonderful to be together. It's an opportunity to, uh, to rejoice in the, in the message of grace and the, the friendships that we have and the ministry that we share. It's wonderful to, um, to fellowship with like-minded folks that believe the same things that you believe. But it's also wonderful to fellowship with like-minded folks who are serious about the work of the ministry, about what it takes to stand and to, um, to proclaim a message with faithfulness in a local geographic area and to, uh, to, to pay the price that it, that it takes to, uh, to maintain a ministry and to maintain a testimony because uh, this message touched our lives and we want to touch others with it. And uh, if there's not somebody speaking it, the, uh, the message isn't going out as it should, and it's not going to have that impact. But it is, a, it is truly a joy, and uh, we're, uh, our friendships and through uh, all kinds of weather, as Marvin said, it's been, uh, it's been a good ride, and it ain't over yet. I don't think you can, you know, we're not, I'm not too, quite ready to uh, uh, pass out just yet, but we'll see. Um, open your Bible to Romans chapter number 1. The, the theme this weekend, the God factor, The God factor, the issue of being uh, of God in our culture, of the presence of God, the working of God, the, rel- the uh, God being relevant and important and uh, and vital in a, in a culture and in a world, it is truly um, uh, a fact that that we do live in dark days. There are the, you, you you marvel, and I I remember how my parents used to talk, and grandparents. I was born and raised in an f- old farmhouse. And my grandparents um, lived right there with us. And I, I could hear them talk from time to time. Now I'm talking like they talk about the good old days, about the way things used to be, about the, the, the things you, you see on TV or the things you see in, in happening in society. And, uh, and now it's just, it's just full speed ahead and so blatantly um, chaotic and, uh, and difficult in so many ways. It's just stunning. And... As, as we think about that, the, um, the days that we have are dark and dreary and, and chaotic and we see the institutions dissolving before us and the, the stability in life and ministry and, and in culture. And uh, you're, almost, you're almost fearful to, uh, to go about the deeds of your, of your life. You see these different things that are happening in different parts of the country and different parts of the world. And uh, we had... Uh, um, a sister-in-law who uh, used to have a have a, a 38 and she wanted to uh, she she had that but she never used it she never registered maybe she did register she just decided she didn't want it and she was going to she was going to sell it or, or pawn it she wanted to know if any any members of the family wanted to have wanted to have a weapon have have a have a piece you know <laughs> and i thought well we'll take it you never and you know with all the events in the last few few days and uh, and few months and over the past year you think you know, I'd have never thought like that before, but you just kind of wonder. You know, maybe it's maybe it's a good thing. To, I'm glad that we've got people in our church, and I don't even know who they are really. I find out little things once in a while, but I'm glad somebody in our assembly is carrying, because you you never know what might happen. You know, it's just it's just. But we wouldn't have thought that way 20, 30 years ago, and now it happens on a regular basis, and the, the, the days are dark. And my topic is God is not dead. And that, as Rick said, there was a movement um, about that uh, several, several years ago. There was a movie just recently in the last two or three years by that title. And the premise is that there was a college professor that challenged his students to prove on the very first day of class to prove that God exists. And if anybody wanted to take up the challenge, they would fail if they didn't convince the rest of the class that God existed. And, of course, the, the story went on, and the, the backdrop of the story was is that the, the, the college professor at a younger age was disappointed by what he thought God, how he thought God had failed him in the death of his mother. And so he became bitter and angry about that, and that, that whole thing plays out at the, at, the, at the end of the movie and so on. But people associate God with the things he does and and his his presence and his activity or their his their perception of what they think he is or how they how he operates 
We, uh, we heard the question back on 9-11 in 2001, where was God? Where was God on 9-11? Where was God just a few days ago in Dallas when all those things happened? Has God abandoned our society? Has God, has God left it um, and, it is, it, and it's irrelevant. Well, the, the issue of disappointment and loss and darkness and declension and all of those things and chaos and moral decline, can I tell you, as we look around and sometimes in shock and, and, and disbelief, that that is nothing new? That is absolutely, positively nothing new. And I want to take a few minutes this evening to, uh, to demonstrate that with you in the Scripture in, in, and then finish with, a, with a, contradict, or, uh, a contrasting point that would encourage you and hopefully set the stage for the weekend uh, and, uh, and, the, and the following meetings. You have Romans chapter number 1. Let me just read here the way the, the, the great epistle of the Apostle Paul begins in this first chapter. And Rick quoted verse 28. I'd like to read verses 28 through 32 and have a word of prayer as we begin. Romans, 8, Romans 1 verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge... God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. What an, what an amazing, doesn't that read like the newspaper? It, it's, a, it's a description of what we see going on around us. Yet the Apostle Paul here is writing about some events back in, in the, you know, shortly after the foundation of history, back in the days of the Tower of Babel, when God gave up the Gentiles because they didn't like to retain God in their knowledge. When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. And God says, okay, have at it. God gives them over to the reprobate mind and to the lust of their flesh and to the vile affections. And there's the result back then. So what we're seeing is nothing new. We should not be shocked by it. I want to demonstrate some things with you. Go, go back to the book of Ecclesiastes with me just for a moment. Ecclesiastes chapter number, number 1. Ecclesiastes chapter number 1. In the days of Solomon, as he writes this, this, um, the, the book of Ecclesiastes. And what's the basic, what's one of the basic phrases that's repeated over and over again. There's nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1.4, one generation passes away, another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to its place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north, and it whirleth about continually. The wind returneth again to its circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, and yet the sea is not full unto one place from whence the rivers come. Thither they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing which hath been is that which shall be. The thing which hath been. What, what's that? What's that? That's time past. The things that have been in the past are the things that are what are going to happen when? In the future. <laughs> the thing which hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. We see that, that, that sense that the, the past is going to be repeated in the future and the present is that which has been done in the past. The point is that what we're seeing, and, and Romans chapter 1 demonstrates that, we should get over the shock and awe of it and, and recognize that this is nothing new and that God's people have always had to face these kind of things and that it should fill us with a sense of resolve and purpose. And, and he, he says in verse number 11, there is no remembrance 
of the former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of the things that are to come with those that shall come after. There's a, there's a failure in the sense of history. The history of our country and its foundation has been, has been obliterated from the educational system, so there's no, there's no compass about the value and the, the formation of the country in, in days gone by. There's no sense of history there. And so you see all of these things uh, transpire. Turn over to chapter number 3 with me. Chapter number 3, Ecclesiastes bears this out over and over again. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 9. What profit hath he that worketh in wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from beginning to end. There you see the issue of creation and the issue of the witness of conscience. How that God, and that's said in Romans chapter 1 too, isn't it? That there is a witness of the creation to the, to the creator and the design of the creator and the, the Godhead of the creator. And the, uh, uh, all of those things are, 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 are borne out. There's a witness in the heart of man. And, uh, and at verse number 12, and I know that there is no good in them. <laughs> There's the depravity. <laughs> we see that, don't we? But for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. There's self-determination <laughs> and volition and freedom of choice to go forward. We see all of these things there. And then he says in verse number 14, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be what? forever. Isn't that a comfort? So with all of the things that are going on around us, shouldn't we be focusing more and more on that which will last forever, that will make, make a difference 10,000 years from now, 100,000 years from now, in our sense of time, investing in eternal things. He, sa- he goes on to say, and verse 13, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all of his labor, the self-determination there. And whatever God does, he's going to do forever. Verse 15, that which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been. (laughs) And God requireth that which is past. There's accountability. And we we see that too. So Solomon bears out the fact that today, as as in times past, there's, there's nothing new under the sun. And I want to demonstrate some of those things with you briefly here, and then, uh, and then finish with a, um, with a contrast. Verse, um, verse number 16, And moreover I saw under the sun the place of judgment, and that wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. there is, there's the corruption in the society and the leadership. All of these things are, uh, are, are not new. It's just new to us because we're watching these things in the, with such a sense of contrast to what we've known. And the issue that God is not dead. <laughs> He's, Paul says over and over again, we serve the living God. The, the Thessalonians, they turn to God from idols to serve the living God. God isn't dead. <laughs> He's alive and well. And what he does is for how long? Forever. No matter what the culture is, no matter what goes on around us. Let's demonstrate that. Go back to the book of Genesis with me. Genesis chapter number 6. Genesis chapter number 6. We see in the, in the days of Noah, the days that were before the flood. Genesis chapter number 6 and verse 5. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. And God saw the wickedness of man that was, was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What, a, what, a, what an awful commentary that is. Drop down to verse number 10. He says, And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, and all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. That was in the days of Noah. Noah looks around and, he, and, and, uh, and, and the commentary here, how, how God sees that the earth is filled with violence and the, the heart of man is just dreaming up evil, only evil continually. And yet what does the Lord Jesus Christ say? 
He says, as in the days of Noah, way back in the days before the flood, so shall also the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. The the situation in Noah's day is going to be parallel in the situation at the second coming of Jesus Christ. That which hath been is that which shall be. Nothing new here, is there? It's always been that way because of the nature of man. Come to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter number 18. Leviticus chapter number 18. Corruption and violence and uh, 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 wickedness. Leviticus chapter number 18 and verse 20. Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 20 as, as Moses is giving the law to the nation of Israel. Leviticus 18 and verse 20, Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. Thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire unto Molech. There's child sacrifice and murdering of the young and the innocent. You see homosexuality there in in verse number, or you you see um, adultery in verse number 20. Verse 22, there's the homosexuality. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is, it is an abomination. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. Defile not ye yourselves with any of these things. For in all these the nations are defiled which I cast out before you. Those things were prevalent in Moses' day. Was, would we say that God was dead in the days of Moses? While all those things were going around, what was, where was God working? God was working with His people in the lives of the nation of Israel and giving birth to a nation and instructing a nation and, and teaching that nation because He had a purpose to fulfill for the earth. Would we say that God was dead in the days of Noah? Noah was a preacher of righteousness and, and testified to that generation there. And God preserved Noah through that time and and took him through the flood and and gave him a commission after the flood to go out on 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 a renewed earth. We see here sexual perversion and lawlessness and uh, uh, child sacrifice. All of these things, they're just just so prevalent now and, and it's been sanctioned by the culture. And horrific things are taking place. Come to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. We continue to go forward and, and, and just notice how these things just uh, repeat themselves. Isaiah chapter 59. Here we see corruption in the nation. The nation of Israel had been formed by God. They'd had a, a, a wonderful history and, uh, and, and great characters there, but the decline in the nation, the northern kingdom first and then the southern kingdom fall into apostasy. And Isaiah's ministry here, He says, Isaiah Isaiah chapter 59, verse 12, For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us, and our transgressions are with us. And as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, religious apostasy and declension and idolatry and wickedness and, 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 uh, and spiritual decline is, is uh, abundant here. Verse number 13, in transgressing, lying against the Lord, departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, rebellion against the truth, that is, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, and judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Where is truth? Where's an absolute? Where's a final authority? Moral relevance and, 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 and decline and, and, and no final authority anywhere, it seems, in the days of Isaiah. Verse number 15, Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment falsehood and lawlessness and apostasy and wickedness in the days of Isaiah. Was God dead in the days of Isaiah just because there was wickedness and spiritual declension and and truth had fallen in the street? No, God was still working with His people. He had a purpose that He had had pled and and, and laid out with Abraham and the nation of Israel. Those wonderful promises that Israel had to look forward to and to rest in and to rejoice in. 
and we look around and we see the things we we see the things in our day, and I thought, frankly, beloved, we just got to get over the shock factor. These these things are 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 part of history, and it's being repeated again and again and again. And America was just, was such a. a he said it was a fluke. It was a, it was a marvelous experiment that demonstrated a country founded on, on biblical principles with, with some character and, and, and righteousness at its core based on the Word of God could, could do great things and economic freedom and, and accountability and that, and that conscience that was within the nation. But there's, there's that, that still steady and slow decline. Was God dead in the days of Isaiah? No, he wasn't. Was God irrelevant in the days of Isaiah? Absolutely not. There's nothing new under the sun. What we're seeing today is not an an aberration, but it's something that that, that as a result, the real problem was stated really clearly back there in in Genesis chapter number 6. It's been the problem all along that the, 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 the imaginations and the thoughts of man's heart is only evil continually. And Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful and above all things and desperately wicked. It's it's human nature. And we we see that demonstrated again and again in the days of the Lord Jesus. Come over to the um, uh, the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter number 14. Matthew chapter number 14, the the fullness of the time had come and and the Lord had sent John the Baptist and and sent the Lord Jesus Christ and the time had come and the kingdom of heaven was at hand. And in a a tremendously oppressive and heavy-handed society, political oppression and the iron fist of the the Roman Empire ruling there. In uh, Matthew chapter 14, um, verse number 3, For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. And John said unto him, it is, for John had said unto him, it's not lawful for thee to have her. John stood up in protest for what was going on there and as as, as a witness there. In verse number 5, and when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them, and it pleased Herod. I don't have to draw you a picture of that, do I? There's corruption in the political realm that led to uh, manipulation and blackmail. <laughs> and, and uh, of course, the, the, the death of John the Baptist. Verse number 8, and she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here the, John the Baptist's head in the charger. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, for the oath's sake and for them that had sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her. And he sent and beheaded John in prison. Would we say that God was dead in the days of John the Baptist? Absolutely not. The Lord Jesus Christ himself was there. God was in their midst. Even though there's all of these things taking place around them and all the corruption in the society and the declension in the nation of Israel, the apostasy in Israel. The religious leaders had taken the temple and added all those religious traditions to it and turned it into a house of merchandise and a money-making endeavor and were struggling to to maintain their power and their control and their dominance of the people. Religious apostasy and, and moral declension and political oppression in the days of John the Baptist. Was God dead then? Was God irrelevant then? There was a purpose. There was a message that was being proclaimed. There was nothing new under the sun. Come to the book of Philippians. In the life of the Apostle Paul, corruption. And I, I've come to see this quite some time ago, that um, the, the book of Philippians, and Paul, went when he went to Philippi, it doesn't say that he went into the synagogue as his manner was, like in Thessalonica and Corinth and other places. Where did Paul have to go to minister at Philippi? He had to go outside the city where prayer was wont to be made, where the women resorted thither, because evidently there was not a a, a testimony, a a public testimony as corrupt as it might have been, a Jewish synagogue inside the city. It was, uh, Philippi was a colony, and the the, the Roman Empire there had a a stronghold. And we know what happened to the Apostle Paul. 
um, the, the, uh, the authorities there took him and they, they took him and, and because he had, had cast the, the demonic spirit out of that, that little girl, they took him and they drug him into the public arena. They, they beat him and then they, they stripped him and then they threw him in the, in the prison and, and his feet in the stocks. You know, that, that political oppression there and that heavy handed as, as Paul is carrying out his ministry. And what does he say to the Philippians? Philippians chapter 1 Verse number 29, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which ye saw in me and now here to be in me. The Philippians were suffering political oppression at the hands of the, of the, of the, of the government there. And political corruption and, and trying to, trying to, to uh, suppress the work of the ministry and the testimony of Jesus Christ there. Nothing new under the sun. The political oppression and, and heavy-handed of, of uh, governmental authorities in different parts of the world. Um, in America, we're probably no doubt heading in that, same, in that same direction. And as you see all these things... My point in in going through this dark list is that when we look around us today and we see these things happening in our culture and we see these things happening in the world and we see the things around the globe and we see the breaking down of borders and we see internationalism and we see chaos and, and all the things that go with it, is it anything new? Is it anything unique? There's nothing new under the sun. It's what has been is what is now and what is now is what was and what is now is what shall be. Sin and wickedness has always been prevalent in society. But was God dead in the days of Noah? Was he dead in the days of Moses? Was he he irrelevant in the days of Isaiah and working through the nation of Israel and also in the, in the, the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ? Absolutely, absolutely not. There was tremendous activity. Evil and wickedness and violence and war and corruption and apostasy is nothing new. God has always been relevant. God was not dead then and God is not dead now. He's always been working out his purpose. What we see around us, there is nothing new under the sun. But wait a minute. Is there something new? under the sun today? Turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. I've been setting you up. Ephesians chapter 2. There is something new. There is something different today. Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 13. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, Ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinance for to make in himself of twain one, what? New man. Hey, there's a new group of people on the scene today. Something that was not testified under the sun in time past. There's a new people. There's a new purpose. There's something new that God is carrying out today in the midst of our dark, dark days. A new creature is being formed. The church, the body of Christ, and God has a new purpose that he is, that he is carrying out. Ephesians chapter number 3. Because of this new purpose, because of this new habitation of God, this new place where God lives and dwells and manifests himself. Ephesians 3 verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Is there something new under the sun today? Absolutely. A new purpose. 
A new purpose that God is manifesting himself. God, is, God has a new purpose that he is carrying out today in the dispensation of grace. And just like God was at work in the days of Noah, he had a purpose and he had a plan. And the things that in the days of, of Solomon, that the things that God, do, God, God does will, will be forever. God has a wonderful new pass, uh, purpose, a new apostle, a new message. And a a new purpose. He calls it an eternal purpose. He has a message of grace. A message that has been kept secret since the world began, but was manifested in a point in time through the, through the, the salvation and then the, then the commission and ministry of Saul of Tarsus who became Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles. And God goes out with a new message about the riches and the exceeding riches of his grace and the provisions that this new people will have in the person of Jesus Christ according to the riches of his grace with sin put away and sin dealt with and righteousness imputed and new life imputed and a hope and a destiny that is sure that is that is that 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 we can look forward to and rejoice in and a new purpose and a new apostle there is something new under the sun turn over to second timothy second timothy chapter number one second timothy chapter number one second timothy chapter number one he says in verse number seven, as he's passing the baton to Timothy, he knows that Timothy's life, or Paul knows that his life is coming to a close. And he's trying to encourage Timothy. And he says in verse seven, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with an holy calling. We have a holy calling today. A holy calling to shine as lights in a dark world. To hold forth the message of grace and to proclaim it and to proclaim the manifold wisdom of God and the person of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ who when He rose from the dead was declared to be the Son of God with power, the heir of all things. We have that wonderful message to proclaim. He says in verse number 9, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ appeared again, didn't He? He appeared to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus saved him by his grace and appeared to him in a series of, 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 of subsequent revelations and appearances and deposited in with him the, the, the gospel of the grace of God so Paul could go out and lay the foundation and be the, be the wise master builder and build up this new, this new entity, this new household, this new building of God, not made with hands, but, it, but, but the new creature. And it's now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereof I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Is there something new under the sun? (laughs) Not as far as sin and wickedness goes, but there's a wonderful new message of grace to proclaim. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give us the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And now we're a sweet savor of God in them that perish and in in them that are saved. We have this great privilege. A new apostle, a new purpose, a new man, a new message, a new purpose to reveal, to hold out before the world, and it's now made manifest. Look what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Those are the characteristics of the perilous times. There's religion mixed into it. 
having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. When Paul is talking about these last days here, I don't think he's talking about some future last days. I think he's talking about the days that Timothy was living in. And he talks about the people that are there. And Timothy, when you see these things from such, turn away. They're there in Timothy's, the evil men and seducers are are there in Timothy's uh, uh, setting and, and life and context. And there's a ministry that he is to carry out in the midst of dark days. And he, there's, there's a message that's been committed to his trust, a treasure that God placed in earthen vessels to, to manifest the, the gospel of the grace of God. And Timothy is challenged here. He, down in verse 13, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But Timothy, maybe you just better hunker down and, and uh, wait for the Lord to come and get you. Is that what he says? But Timothy, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hath been assured of, and hath, uh, and hath knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy's got the book. He's got the message that the Apostle Paul had committed to him, that, that Paul had committed to Timothy. He's got the written word of God, and all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, and it thoroughly furnishes us. All Scripture, verse 16, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works in perilous times or in good times. You've got everything you need in that book, Timothy, to do what God has commissioned you to do. And now get on with the program in the midst of the dark days. Don't be intimidated by the things that are going around. Shine the light and proclaim it. You know what? We, we sit here today and we have a message that works in a dark day. It worked in your life. And that message needs to be proclaimed. Think of the verse in Romans 1, verse 13. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You know what gave Paul a sense of boldness and confidence? It wasn't his natural nature. He says, I was with you in weakness and in fear but in much, and in much trembling. But his confidence, confidence, confidence was in the, the message that he preached because the gospel worked. It transformed lives and touched people and and brought them from darkness to light and gave them forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. It's a wonderful purpose. And the darker it is, the brighter the light will shine. I like that analogy. Maybe we all ought to get these straw hats and, you know, get the the beards growing and, you know, so we stand out, right? No, uh -uh, we don't need to do that. We just stand out by the message we preach and the life we live. We stand out even in in the religious world, don't we? Because it's so different to proclaim the riches of the the message and the completeness that we have in Christ Jesus in the person of our Savior. Paul had a message that worked in dark days. There was something new under the sun. And we we, we stand in that great truth today. Two passages and we'll quit. Come with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The gospel works in the lives of people. It works in dark days. And in Paul's time of life and ministry, it worked in the lives of the Corinthians. This is an interesting passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 9, he writes to them and he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's not a very nice list, is it? But you know the next verse. And such, what? Were some of you... (laughs) But you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The gospel works in dark days. It doesn't matter 
what kind of cult what we're facing in the culture. It doesn't matter what's broadcast week after week after week on, on, the, on the television set and the, and the news cycle. Go about the business of, that God has given us to carry on and shine the light and, and proclaim the gospel of the grace of God. God is not dead. <laughs> is he? Is he dead in your life? He's real, isn't he? <laughs> His son is real. And, and, and we live with a, with a sense of, of full assurance of understanding. And we know that what God doeth, it, it is forever. <laughs> and we need to rejoice in that and have confidence and uh, get over the shell shock and get on with the program. <laughs> Philippians, let's quit. Philippians chapter number 2. We were, we were there just a, a, little, a minute ago. Philippians chapter number 2. God is not dead. God is at work in the world. God is relevant in the world. And He desires to be in our lives and to, for us to stand in the midst of these dark days. This Philippian church, He says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, Philippians 2, 12, As ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Sounds like God is pretty much alive and well to me. He's alive in the Philippians' lives. He says, work it out. Take that life that's inside of you and, and work it out and demonstrate it because God is... is, is is working in your lives and he's he'll enable you both to will he'll create the motivation through the love of christ constraining you and the the accomplishment of it because of he's able to do exceeding abundantly in us according to the power that works in us so he says in verse 14 do all things without murmurings and disputings that you may be blameless and harmless the sons of god without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation there I like that. <laughs> Where, they, were, they were in the midst of a heavy-handed political society there, probably much more oppressive than, than where you and I are so far. But he says um, that you may uh, be the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I had not run in vain, neither labored in vain. My friends, it's a, these, these dark days are, not, are, are days that should break our hearts in one sense with the, with the, the decline of our nation, but it should fill us with, with, with conviction and resolve because the message we have works and, and it's what God's given us to proclaim and it will rescue, not the culture. The culture's on its way, isn't it? but it will rescue people out of that. Make them join heirs with Jesus Christ and raise up a testimony that will go on should the, should the dark days continue. These are great days of opportunity. God is not dead. The God factor is uh, uh, real in our lives. And we have, we have a book that we can rest in. We do have a sense of history. We have His story. <laughs> and He's faithful uh, to, to every every. Uh, individual that he's had in his age and his timetable down through history as he accomplishes his purpose. Amen? Amen? Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We do thank you for life in your Son and the life of your Son that was given for us and the, the life that, that now lives in us. We thank you for the fellowship of the saints, the, 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 the great privilege of being laborers together, holding forth the word of life, to be encouraged at, a, at a, a, a meeting such as this. But Lord, as we, as we uh, look around us, may we be filled with hearts of, of, of love and compassion to, uh, to, to pay the price, to be faithful, to preach a pure message, a pure gospel in these dark days and to stand uncompromisingly for it, whatever the price might be. And Lord, as we do that, we know that the gospel works. It worked in our hearts and lives and you'll continue to accomplish your purpose. And we thank you for that great privilege. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.